Hello. Welcome to the Behavioral Finance Dialogues on Corona Crisis video series. My name is Yas Gülnur Muradoğlu. I'm a professor of finance and director of Behavioral Finance Working Group. I work for the School of Business and Management at Queen Mary University of London. Today, I will be speaking to my colleague, Professor Meir Stapman at Santa Clara University in the US. We will discuss second generation behavioral finance and the times of COVID-19. If you enjoy this video, please share it and subscribe to the Queen Mary University of London YouTube channel. And please come back and listen to the other talks in the series. We'll start with your new book, The Second Generation in Behavioral Finance. And tell us um, what it says to us about the corona crisis, how people behave, what can be done, well, let, let me begin by differentiating the second generation of behavioral finance, uh, not only with the first generation, but also with the uh, standard finance. So in standard finance, people are rational, computer-like rational, wanting only wealth. Uh, in the first generation, we move to the other extreme and we describe them as irrational, stupid idiots, uh, who make mistakes on the way to getting their wealth. In the second generation, we move people back to the middle. Uh, they are normal. We are normal. I am normal and you are normal. How can we distinguish them? Here, here is a quick example. Think about lottery tickets. Standard finance says, Rational people don't buy lottery tickets because they have negative expected return and they surely do not add to your expected wealth. The first generation of behavioral finance said, well, they make cognitive errors. They don't know math and statistics. They exaggerate the odds of winning. The second generation says people are normal and normal People want utilitarian benefits, expressive benefits, and emotional benefits in everything they do and buy and use. So what are the expressive benefits of buying a lottery ticket? Well, when I buy a lottery ticket, I express myself as a player. I'm in the game. Mm -hmm. I have a chance of winning. I have, expressive, I have emotional benefits in addition to the expressive ones, because I have hopes I can now plan all I'm going to do with the money that I'm going to win. And of course, there are possibly utilitarian benefits because I might actually win. And so it is important to see that, you know, when people buy lottery tickets, imagine that, that, that you see somebody who is about to buy a lottery ticket and you say, you know, you're making a cognitive error. The odds of winning are not really one in 100 million, as you think, uh, but one in 200 million. <laughs> well, will it deter you from buying a lottery ticket? Of course not. You know, that, 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 that there's a big difference between having no chance and having some chance, however minuscule it is. And that is normal. Everybody understands what it is. People are like that, isn't it? Well, I when people buy lottery tickets. I mean, I don't buy lottery tickets, but uh, most people around me, they do buy lottery tickets and they do enjoy it. I mean, it gives them a chance exactly. to and for a week. Exactly. So, so uh, I cannot really think of somebody who I would not describe as normal in this way. That is, if we call irrational people who make some cognitive mistake, well, we are all irrational you know it just does not make sense now in this time of COVID-19 if you ask yourself what are the cognitive and emotional errors well you have to first see that the second generation of behavioral finance does not obliterate the first that is people do commit cognitive and emotional errors but they do so on the way to what they want. And so you have to begin with whatever people want. 
So what are the cognitive and emotional errors that we see now? Well, think of fear. Now, fear is not an error at all. You know, sometimes we talk about emotions as if emotions just imply emotional errors. Fear, of course, is a very useful emotion that God or evolution put in us for good reason. But of course, fear can become panic. And I'm not suggesting that I know the precise line that separates fear and panic. But obviously, if you look at the stock market, uh, uh, people who sold stocks uh, when they went down deeply are now regretted. And so uh, regret, of course, is another emotion that is very useful, but not here. Uh, you can think about hindsight, you know, in hindsight it is clear what we should have done before and what we should be doing now. Uh, you can think of representativeness, judging by similarity, where people say, well, it's like 2008 or it's like 1929. Uh, well, 2008 and 1929 are very different and this third time might be very different from both of these. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the major things this time is the fear, the strength of the fear. And in the previous crisis in 2008, well, we didn't have a fear of death. This time, the trigger was really the fear of death. So in every decision, in every individual decision, in every governmental decision, in every financial decision, the trigger point was very fundamental. It started with the fear of death. And I think we have seen some sort of reflections of this fear of death in several aspects of life, including the financial aspects of life. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> because what's, what's the point of wealth if you're dead? Uh, and, and, you know, and even if, if uh, uh, family members, friends, and so on, that uh, wealth can hardly compensate uh, for that. And so, you know, one of the things that people want is to be true to their values. And one reflection of being true to your values today is compassion. That is, you can see, I can see my neighbors, I can see friends who are really going out to help, not just people they know, but people they don't know. Uh, I have a friend who established a pantry. She stocked it with food for people to take uh, if they need it. People make a face masks for others and, and so on. So some good is coming out of this terrible time that we are in. That's true. I mean, we've seen good things, we've seen bad things. Uh, I mean, we've seen the supermarket runs as well on the other extreme, what people can do with the fear of hunger. That's another very fundamental fear, isn't it? It is, it is. And, and so people stocked up on food, uh, people uh, <laughs> stocked up on toilet paper. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so it is, it is, uh, people care about themselves and their families first, and that is perfectly uh, normal. But what is special is really to see how wide that circle of compassion is and how people care about people they don't know because some of us and I'm among them and you are who are able to work from home and, and get a income uh, are in very good shape relative to people who have lost their job and who are living paycheck to paycheck and that really is something that we should always remember. That's very true. And the, um, I mean, there were, I don't know how it was in America, but we had several neighborhood COVID aid groups here for people to help each other. So if you can't go out, one of your neighbors could bring you food. And the food banks, uh, at one stage, the donations diminished to the food banks because people weren't go going out. So these neighborhood groups coordinated uh, bringing food to the food banks. And there was a lot of goodness that you observed as well. Yes, and I totally agree with you. We should never forget uh, the people living from paycheck to paycheck. In some instances, 
uh, that are paid on a daily basis. That is right. Yeah, yeah. Here in our neighborhood, we have an organization called Second Harvest that provides food for the for the poor. I regularly contribute to them, but I sent them an extra contribution uh, this time because I know that the needs are great. I can see lines of people, pictures of lines of people standing waiting for food. It really it breaks your heart. Bank of England estimates the um, slowdown, the, the loss in output as 14% for the UK, and which is comparable to a crisis in 1709, which was triggered by weather conditions, natural causes again, but this time the soil frosted. So the corona crisis in diff is different in many aspects because this is a demand side crisis. Uh, with the lockdowns right. and people is really, yeah. go out. Yeah, it is, it is really, th this is not a matter of, of the stock market crashes and, and housing prices collapse. Uh, here you have an illness uh, that, that is unseen. Every time you go out, you're afraid that it will happen to you. Uh, it is not just something that you can uh, cure quickly. It seems that even people who are supposedly cured uh, have permanent damage to, to heart and liver and other organs. It is really quite scary. It is. It is. I mean, hope, hope we can get out of this. Um, as normal human beings, <laughs> with our yeah. goods and our bads, yeah. our strengths and biases, and you know, come out of it as normal as we can. We will. We will. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm delighted to speak with you, Gulnur. Thank you.